This is a look at problem number 55, from chapter 34. I believe this was in your homework. You've got a cylinder of transparent material like polystyrene plastic or glass. You shoot a beam of light into it. Let's just think of it as a laser. And it's supposed to bounce around due to total internal reflection. And when viewed from above, the idea is that the light would bounce around and form a closed regular polygon. For instance, an equilateral triangle, which would look something like this. So your laser beam is bouncing around here. <clears throat> and at each meeting with the with the outside or with the edge of the material, this is the boundary between the glass, for instance, and the air. It's supposed to suffer total internal reflection. And remember, we always measure angles with respect to the normal here. So this is what we would call theta incident. Oh, got that backwards. This would be theta incident right here. Theta incident. This would be the reflected ray, which we know is the same as theta incident. So I suppose they're both theta incident. And hopefully you recall that uh, the condition for total internal reflection, total internal reflection, is that theta incident must be greater than the so-called critical angle. And to calculate the critical angle, if, if this is index of refraction n, and outside we have index of the air, which we take to be 1, we would say that n sine theta critical is equal to n of air sine of 90. This is how we find the uh, critical angle. And the sine of 90, of course, is 1. The index of refraction for air we take to be 1. And I hope you see that theta critical would be the arc sine of 1 over n. I wouldn't get attached to this as the formula for theta critical because it's only applicable if the index or if the medium on the other side of the boundary is air specifically, then this formula would work. If it wasn't air, you would have some other index of refraction right here. Okay, well, generally the critical angle is, let's say, around 45 degrees. Of course, it's going to depend on the two media, but it looks to me like this angle is probably less than the critical angle if this were glass and this were air. So I wouldn't expect all of the light energy to bounce off of this interface. I would expect a lot of it to refract out into the medium. Some of the energy would be lost. So we need this angle to be larger. And you could visualize if you had more sides in your regular polygon. Now this was supposed to be a square. It's looking more like a rectangle. But if I look at those reflections, draw the normal line, this angle is larger than it was for the triangle. So it's possible, depending on the material, that this angle would be greater than the critical angle, in which case all of the light energy would reflect. So the more sides you have, the bigger this angle opens up, the more likely it would be that you would have total internal reflection. So for a given material, for a given index of refraction out of which the cylinder is made, we'd like to figure out what's the minimum number of sides, capital N. So one thing we have to know, but well, we have to be able to, to calculate this angle. Um, and uh, this is a fact from geometry that you may recall. Did I recall this? Mm, well, I remember it from last year, but when we did it last year, I may have had to Google it. Then, uh, some of the angles in an n-sided polygon. Well, you, I think most of you know for a triangle, all of these angles add up to 180 degrees. So a triangle has three sides and the sum of the angles is 180. A quadrilateral, take a rectangle for instance, 90, 90, 90, 90, nine times four, these angles add up to uh, 360, and there are four sides. So you might be able to guess a rule just based on those first two cases. I probably wouldn't guess the rule. I do know the rule, though. 
um, you take 180 degrees and you multiply it by the number of sides you're talking about minus two. Simple as that. Let's, let's test for these two cases. Triangle has n equal to three. Three minus two is one, one times 180. Does give us the correct sum of the angles. Here we're expecting 360. Four sides minus two, that's two, two times 180 would give 360. Right, it appears to work at least for the two most obvious cases. So the condition we're looking at here, well, since it's a regular, it's supposed to be a regular polygon, that means all the angles are equal. Uh, you can see from the symmetry that the normal line is always going to cut each of these interior angles in half. So this angle would be half of the angle of each, or half of each interior angle. Well, if you've got four sides, if, if this is the sum of all the angles, uh, all four of your angles, would you just, wouldn't you just divide by four to get the angle for each? Um, in this case, if we want the angle of an, at the vertice, or vertex, excuse me, the angle at the vertex of an equilateral triangle, we know that's 60 degrees, is it? Yeah, 180 divided by three would give us 60. So you take the, the sum of all the angles and divide by how many angles there are, and that would give you the measure of each angle. So what we need to do is take the sum of all the angles, divide by the number of vertices, which is the same as the number of sides, and that would be the interior angle. Lastly, we would have to chop that in half to get the angle of incidence that your laser beam makes with the normal. So lastly, we would just take half of that and call that theta incident. And most of the work now is done. I'm gonna write that on the other side of the page here. We need this angle to be greater than theta critical. So the requirement is that theta critical is less than the angle of incidence. That's the requirement for total internal reflection. Well, we've already calculated the critical angle. It's the arc sine of one over n. That needs to be less than, less than or equal to, I suppose. It needs to be less than or equal to this expression. This, this expression gives us the incident angle for this particular geometry. One half of 180 degrees times n minus two, over n. Well, let's simplify this a little bit, huh? Half of 180 is 90. And now we can distribute the bottom n into the, the quantity in parentheses. n over n is 1. So we have 1 minus 2 over n. OK. That's the formula we can use to answer the problem for each specific case. They ask us to calculate what's the minimum number of sides for a variety of materials. What are those materials here? Water, plastic, and cubic zirconia. Let's just do the very first one. So for water, we take the index of a fraction to be 1.33, which you'll notice is about one and a third or four thirds. Okay, I'm just going to calculate the arc sine of 1 over n in one step. So in other words, I'm calculating the, the critical angle here. And I, I actually could solve this for n. Maybe we should go one step further here. Yeah, and uh, I can move some stuff around. I can say 1 minus 2 over n has got to be greater than or equal to arc sine of well, I'll go ahead and write it as theta critical over 90. So I've divided both sides by 90 degrees. And since I've flipped sides, I've switched the direction of the inequality. And that would mean that 1 minus theta critical over 90 is greater than or equal to 2 over n. Okay. And that would mean that n has to be greater than or equal to 2 over 1 minus theta critical over 90 degrees. 
I sure hope I did that algebra correctly. Now I, off to, to the side here, I have in my notes an expression already. And yeah, it looks like it's the same. Okay, first let's calculate theta critical for water. The reciprocal of 1.33 is this number. I take the arc sine of that. Okay, so if you want total internal reflection for a beam of light going from water into air, well, or not going into the air, that's the idea. Uh, the, the angle of incidence would have to be greater than or equal to 48.75 degrees. I'm going to plug that into this formula now. If I divide that by 90, it equals, uh, give it a minus sign, add one, okay? This is my denominator, and I'm going to use my favorite button, the reciprocal button, hit one over x, and I'll multiply that by two. Okay, and would have to be greater than or equal to 4.36. Well, we're talking about an integer here. We're talking about the number of sides in a polygon. It can be three, it can be four, it can't be 4.36. So the next greatest number integer would be five. Okay, if you want this closed regular polygon, it's going to have to be a pentagon for water into air. You'll find when you look at the other materials, uh, they talk about cubic zirconia, or is it zirconium? The, the budget diamond. Now, I probably shouldn't uh, get on the soapbox about this, but don't they say that, that uh, the optical properties of diamond, which made it attractive early in human history, was, was the uh, sparkliness. And the sparkliness has to do with the high index of refraction, the light bends a lot, and we haven't talked about dispersion yet, but the amount by which the light bends also depends on wavelength. That's gonna, we'll, we'll take a look at that later. So you would think that any, any transparent gem that had that same proper, property, but um, to an even greater extent would be just as valuable as diamond. So it wasn't long before people found or manufactured in a lab other materials that are like diamond, but have that same proper property even more exaggerated, but yeah. I don't think there's a very booming uh, wedding ring industry that uses cubic zirconium. I know they're out there, but personally, yeah, I don't care either way, but I guess my point is what, what does give something value? You know, at this point, uh, diamonds are valuable because I suppose because the marketing tells us so. And because uh, the ones that come from the earth are rather rare. Anyway, moving on. Interesting to think about. Like if, if diamonds were in everybody's backyard, if you could just go in your backyard, stick a shovel into the dirt and find diamonds, would they be, would they be valuable? I suppose that's true about most things. Yeah, that's all I had to say about that problem. Here's another fun problem from your homework involving a prism, the geometry of a prism and refraction. You've got a prism where two sides of the triangular prism are equal. In other words, we're talking about an isosceles triangle. <clears throat> they call this the apex angle, alpha. <coughs> Pardon me. And the idea is you would shoot a laser beam into the prism at just the right angle so that on its way through the prism, the beam is traveling parallel to the bottom face and then it will exit. And you can use the measured angles here. It wouldn't be hard to set this prism. If you had an actual glass prism, for instance, you could set it on a piece of paper, get out a ruler, trace out these lines, and later remove the prism, measure the angles, and apply Snell's law to determine some stuff here. So that's what this is about. You can use the angles to figure out the index of a fraction. That's one way you could use this setup. And you might imagine that if this material had a higher index of refraction than this one, you know, suppose this is regular glass and this is cubic zirconia, you would imagine, or you might imagine, that this angle would have to be larger because a material with a higher index of refraction tends to bend light more. So if you wanted it to come out in this direction, you would have to be coming in at an even greater angle because it's going to be bent more. I'll put it this way. 
if this had a higher index of refraction and you sent the laser beam in at the same direction it was going before, it would bend even more, which means it would come out like this, which is not what you want. So let's look at the geometry and see if we can relate this angle and the apex angle and the angle, uh, or excuse me, the index of refraction. Here's how I'm going to do this. Your solutions manual uses the, uses the letter phi to refer to the refracted angle. Did I do that right? Is that phi? Hang on a second. Phi is the angle that the refracted ray makes with the normal, yes. So this is angle of incidence. This is the refracted angle phi. Well, what is a normal? A normal is perpendicular to the face of the prism. So we know that this is 90 degrees, all right? So what does that make this angle? If this is phi, this would have to be 90 minus phi, and we'll use that in a moment. I'm going to, excuse me, I'm gonna cut alpha in half. This is the apex angle. Due to the symmetry here, if I just drop a perpendicular down to the other side, I know that this angle has to be equal to this angle. So let's focus our attention on, hmm, let's focus our attention on this right triangle, shall we, right here? The sum of the angles in this triangle must equal 180. That's true regardless of whether it's a right triangle. So let's see here. Uh, this angle would have to be half of alpha. We got alpha over two plus that 90 degrees there, right here, plus 90 minus phi. Remember, this is the uh, refracted angle. We're calling that phi. So this has to be 90 minus phi. The sum of all those angles has to equal 180 degrees. Hmm. Okay. Well, don't we have 180 on both sides? 90 plus 90 is 180. We've got 180 over here. We can subtract 180 from both sides. In other words, alpha over two minus phi has to equal zero. Evidently, phi would have to be half of alpha. Okay, so we've now related the refracted angle to the apex angle merely by using geometry. There's no application here of Snell's law. But now let's use Snell's law. We know that the incident angle and refracted angle have to obey this equation. N of error sine of beta must equal the index of refraction inside the prism times the sine of phi. But N of error is one, so sine of beta must equal N times the sine of phi. We just determined from the geometry that phi must be half of alpha. So there it is. There is the relation between those three quantities. Not immediately obvious. If you look at this diagram and recognize immediately, immediately that, oh, a beta would be the arc sine of N sine of alpha over two. Well, you're pretty smart. That's uh, part A of the problem, I believe. Yeah, find an expression for beta. Now they give us a specific case. Suppose you actually had a setup like this and specifically, your triangle is equilateral. The result that we wrote down did not depend on the triangle being equilateral. But if it is, if it is equilateral, we know that alpha is 60. 60, 60, 60 adds up to 180. On the paper here. And they're, what they tell us is that alpha is, no, they tell us what beta is. We know that alpha is 60 because it's an equilateral triangle. Which they also, beta is given to be 52.2 degrees. So we've got those two angles. That's 52.2, not, it's not a zero, that's a degree symbol. And we're supposed to find and okay so physically if you took your laser pen 
and moved it around, you would find that the beam inside doesn't come out parallel to the bottom face unless you've got the angle coming in at exactly 52.2. That's what reproduces this geometry. So we take the formula that we already developed and solve it for n. How easy is that? n would have to be the sine of beta over the sine of alpha over two. Well, that would be the sine of 52.2 degrees. And we'll divide by the sine of alpha over two would be 60 over two. That's the sine of 30 degrees. That's easy because I know that the sine of 30 is one half. We divide by one half and multiply by two. So that's two times the sine of 52.2 degrees. We're not expecting a number like 10. Most materials don't have an index of fraction that high. I'm sure they picked a reasonable number. 52.2, I'll take the sine of that angle, multiply by two. That sounds about right, 1.58. Most of those plastics and glasses have an index of a fraction in the ballpark of 1.5. I'm, gonna, I'm going to take a look at number 63 from the chapter 34 homework. I believe this is an assigned problem. But this makes use of mirrors, and we haven't talked about mirrors yet. So I will quickly present the behavior of a concave and convex mirror. This is covered at the end of your chapter. We won't go into it in the detail that we used for, or the detail with which we looked at converging lenses and diverging lenses but you do need to know how mirrors work. This is something you need to know how to do going into your exam. And that's why there are some homework problems about mirrors. Here is a concave mirror, concave towards an object over here. So with lenses, we acknowledge that light could pass through the lens from either direction. This is different. This mirror only reflects light on this side. So this is the silvered side where you could produce an image over here, nothing. We still have the so-called optical axis. And this is a spherical mirror, spherical mirror, which means it's the, the actual mirror surface is part of a much larger circle. And that circle is going to have a particular radius of curvature. So we draw the letter C to indicate center of curvature. Now, it's pretty clear. I didn't draw this very well. If I actually completed this sphere, uh, the center would be somewhere over here, but that's not important to the diagram. Here's a fun fact that you should just know. Uh, well, first of all, what's this distance? How do we, what's the distance from the center of curvature to the mirror? That's the radius of the sphere from which the mirror is formed. So you do need to know that. The radius of curvature goes from the center of curvature to the mirror itself. And you need to know that for a spherical mirror, the focal length of the mirror, we're going to see it does have a focal length, is half the radius of curvature. So that means my focal point is right here. It's halfway out from the mirror to the center of curvature. Um, here's my point P, object point. Let's put a little arrow here and see where the image of this arrow shows up. Okay. Principal rays. The principal rays for a spherical mirror are not the same as the principal rays for a lens, but they're similar. And you need to know them. If I draw a ray that comes in parallel to the optical axis, how would I determine the direction in which this ray reflects? Notice I said reflects, not refracts. We don't have to worry about index of refraction here. There's only one law that's valid or that's applicable, and that's the law of reflection. So if you were to draw the normal line, normal to the mirror, now this, this doesn't really look normal, does it? This would have to be a right angle. I kind of cheated because I know that if you draw the reflected ray so that the angle of reflection equals the angle of incidence, it will approximately pass through the focal point. So an ideal spherical mirror would pass all parallel rays through the focal point. There's your first 
principal ray. Any ray coming in parallel to the optical axis will be reflected through the focal point. That means if you had a whole bunch of parallel rays, all of them would pass through that focal point, which is pretty cool because it allows you to gather light energy into a very small volume. I was on a community college campus one time where they had a very large spherical mirror set up. It was probably three feet across and they were putting hot dogs at the focal point and pointing the mirror at the sun. So imagine all the sun's rays coming in and every square meter you're talking about a kilowatt of power and focusing it at this point here into a small volume. I think the hot dogs lit on fire within a few seconds. So that's a very intense beam of light. Okay, second principal ray. Well, do you notice that the optical axis is already normal to the mirror. Since it passes through the center of curvature, it basically runs along a radius of that circle. So we know that this, uh, this is already a normal, and that means if I draw a ray from here to here, I can just reflect it at equal angles. So to make a good diagram, of course, you would, you'd want to use a protractor and make sure that your reflected ray came out at an equal angle to the optical axis, angle of incidence, angle of re reflection. Okay, and remember two rays alone are supposed to tell you where the image is. This is looking a little cluttered because I've got this extra line here and this bracket, but I can already see that this object will produce an image or it has an image over here the image point associated with the top of the arrow is right here where these reflected rays actually converge. The third, the third ray you could draw, instead of coming in parallel and reflecting through the focus, why don't we go through the focus first? Not the radius, of, not the center of curvature, but the actual focus. Take a guess what this ray is going to do. It's really just the reverse of the top ray. This ray should bounce back parallel to the optical axis. And I cheated a little bit. Yeah, it does look parallel, but I drew it so that it would go through this point. If the light was coming in from the uh, opposite direction, if it was coming in parallel, we know that it would bounce and reflect through the focus. So this ray is just the reverse in a sense, or the opposite of this ray. And that should help you remember it. Both of those rays, it's the same concept. Parallel to the axis means it's gonna go through a focus and it doesn't have to be in that order. It could go through the focus first and then come out parallel. Those are two of your rays. The third ray is the one where you, you hit the so-called vertex of the spherical mirror and you come out at the same angle that you came in at. And that's enough to locate your image. So that's three principal rays. And it looks to me like we have formed a real image. This is a real, image because these rays are actually converging at this point. If you were to put a little piece of paper there, you could see the image formed on that piece of paper. If you put a piece of photographic film there, you could develop an image. And because it's a real image, the image distance is considered to be positive. We've got a positive object distance and we also have a positive image distance. This is a, a little different from lenses. Remember for lenses, if your image showed up on the same side as your object, like for a diverging lens, that was considered to be a negative image distance. Here, we're on the same side and it's a positive image distance. So what determines the sign? It's about the quality of the image or the, is the type. Is it a real image or is it virtual? If it's a virtual image, S prime is negative. In this case, it's a real image. We go with S prime being positive. Now let's do a similar diagram, but this time I'm going to put the object inside the focal point. So just like with lenses, you don't actually need to draw the lens. You just draw a vertical line to represent, I'm, I'm sorry, not the lens, the mirror. We're talking about mirrors here. So this vertical line will represent that concave mirror. I will draw my optical axis. Oh, you know, I just realized 
I expect to have a virtual image this time, and that would be behind the mirror. So I need to put my mirror more like in the middle of the page. Here's my mirror. And I've got uh, a ruler here. So how's about I put the focal point hmm, five centimeters from the mirror. So here's my focal point. And that would mean the center of curvature is here. Okay. C and F. And this time I'll go with an object right here. Uh, I'll make it four centimeters tall. Or just to be safe, we'll go with three. I don't want to put it too close to the focus because I know that weird things will happen if I do that. And weird things are already happening in real life. So that's enough of that. Here's an object in front of the mirror. What does this make you think of? Slightly concave mirror. You've got something real close to the mirror. You ever uh, check your nose hairs in a mirror or your makeup, whatever it is you do in like a makeup mirror? What you're doing is sticking your face real close to the mirror. Your nose is so close to the mirror that it's actually inside the focal point. This last diagram I drew, see how the image is upside down? Well, when you look at a makeup mirror, you don't see your face upside down. It's right side up, so I think we already know what to expect here. Three principal rays. Well, one of them comes in parallel. I'm gonna locate the image point associated with this object point. My ray goes in parallel and reflects through the focus. And you may be thinking, wait a minute, that doesn't look right. This, this reflected ray does not at all obey the law of reflection. I mean, it looks like it's coming in normal to this vertical line. So shouldn't it go right back out normally? No, because we're only using this vertical line to represent the mirror. We don't actually have to draw the curved surface of the mirror. This diagram will work just fine if we go with a vertical line. So in actuality, right here, the mirror would be curved in such a way that the law of reflection would give a ray that goes off in this direction. That's one principal ray. That's not enough to locate the image. Uh, we need two rays that intersect to see where that image is. What's next? Um, let's do the one that bounces off the vertex and comes out at an equal angle. Ugh. You know what? I'm, I'm going to use the protractor because otherwise this diagram is not going to come out very well. Um, I need to know what this angle is. Well, the ray doesn't go out long enough, so if I extend this, to me it's looking like, uh, what is that, 33? Close enough. It's about 32, 33 degrees. So I'll go over, go over to the other side of the protractor and put a mark at 33. And I know that my reflected ray has to pass through that point. Okay. I've now drawn two principal rays for a concave mirror. Concave because when you're looking at the mirror, it's concave towards the object. Uh oh, these rays are not going to intersect, are they? How are we supposed to locate an image if these points don't intersect? Well, it's a lot like diverging lenses. We're talking about a mirror. If you extend these rays backwards, there, there is no actual light energy back here because the mirror blocks the light. But these rays appear to diverge from back here. Hmm, okay. And I think we've located the image. Interesting. So this object, by placing it inside the focal point, we're at we're actually producing an image that's even taller. And it's also upright, so it has not been inverted. And it's a virtual image, so we know that S prime is gonna be a negative number. Let's try that third ray. What do we do with it? How do we find the third ray? Well, remember, um, all that matters is the direction that the ray is coming. So let's, I'm gonna draw a ray that goes from the top of the arrow towards the mirror, 
in the same direction as if it had come from the focal point. So it's going off in this direction, which happens to be the same direction as if it came from the focal point. So I'll make this dotted. This is the trickiest ray. We know that that ray should bounce out parallel to the optical axis. And again, I'm cheating a little bit because I know the way this needs to turn out. All right. Here's a ray emanating from my object in a direction such that it looks like it's coming from the focal point and it will bounce out parallel. Well, to somebody's eyeball over here, it looks like this ray came from back here. We've got confirmation of the behavior of this concave mirror. This is a very different result than my first diagram. So when you put an object outside the focal point, you get a real image that's uh, inverted. I, it's not necessarily reduced. I don't think that's necessarily true, but the inversion is a characteristic of a concave mirror when you put the object outside the focal point. Right. This is a different scenario. Well, it's nice that we can do this with a ray diagram, but is it possible to do it with an equation? How cool is this? It's the exact same equation as the thin lens equation. So I could call it the mirror equation, but it's the same equation. One over S plus one over S prime is one over F. Nothing new to memorize here. Now, I've already forgotten, I think it was five centimeters that I chose for my focal length, yes. Focal length is five, centimeters and my object distance was I put the object how far away two centimeters let's immediately use this equation to find s prime you could use the reciprocal button on your calculator i'm going to go with this way of writing it um, one over s prime would be one over f minus one over s and that means if i get a common denominator here i can say um, 1 over S prime is S minus F over FS. So in other words, S prime would be FS over S minus F. Yeah, honestly, it's probably easier just to use the reciprocal button. I'm going to try it both ways. Okay. S minus F, well, that would be 2 minus 5. Uh-oh, that's a negative number. 2 minus 5 equals, okay, then I take the reciprocal of that because it's in the denominator, times the focal length of five times two, and I get negative 3.33 centimeters. Mm. What's the significance of the minus sign? Remember, a negative image distance means that you're talking about a virtual image. That's the significance. We know that for a concave mirror, a virtual image is one that appears on the opposite side of the mirror. So that tells us that the, the image is over here. Let's check, negative 3.33, is that accurate? Let's see if the ray diagram is consistent with the mirror equation. Almost. To me, this looks more like three and a half centimeters. The discrepancy has to do with the fact that when I drew this parallel ray, I just eyeballed it. I didn't use a protractor. So I kind of fudged everything. I'm using a pen with a finite thickness. If you were more careful with your ray diagram, the results would be more consistent with the mirror equation. Let me try this one other way. If I want to solve for one over S prime, I could take one over F minus one over F. So minus one over S. Focal length of five, reciprocal button. Minus image or object distance of two, reciprocal button, hit equals, hit reciprocal button again. Same result. That's actually faster. Get good with that uh, reciprocal button. Get a little like, uh, what, do you, what do you call that thing that people, holster, you know how people put pistols into holsters? Get a calculator holster, but don't put it on your hip. Have it on, be a real nerd and have it on your arm, like your shoulder. Just whip that calculator out. You wanna be like those uh, competitive sharpshooters. You know, they're on horseback, they're moving and they're still shooting all these bottles off the top of the barrels. Yeah, you'll make a lot of friends like that. People will, will envy you. <clears throat> Is there anything else we can do with this? Magnification. It works just like it did for lenses. The magnification is the ratio, image distance over S with a minus sign. Well, since we've already used the mirror equation to find S prime, we can evaluate the magnification. So that would be negative 
And then don't forget S prime is also negative. Notice it comes out dimensionless, centimeters cancel. Minus minus is positive, just like we expect this image is upright. So we expect the magnification to be a positive number. 1.66 around to 667. That's the magnification. Well, that means that the object height is uh, m times, excuse me, the image height is m times the object height. We've already found the magnification, 1.667 times, and I had forgotten what I chose for the object height, three centimeters. We expect, oh, I'm around. We expect the image height to be five centimeters. It's not gonna come out perfect because my diagram was flawed. Hey, pretty close to perfect. Okay, isn't that remarkable that the ray diagram gives the same results as the mirror equation practically every time? Can't be a coincidence. It should be possible to prove that these two are equivalent, that the numbers that come out of the mirror equation are the same as the numbers you'll get when you measure your ray diagram. So as I've mentioned once before, I challenged a class years ago at a different college to, to prove that. There was one person in the class who was real good with the uh, geometry and he actually produced proof. I had to read it twice to understand it, but yes, you can just take my word for it if you're willing to do that, that the ray diagram does produce the same results. Okay, let's apply this now to the homework problem. Here is my horrifying drawing of the situation in problem number 63. This is about a dentist who's using a, a small concave mirror. Actually, the problem doesn't tell us that it's concave, but they're using a mirror to produce a, a magnified upright image of a person's tooth. And well, if I hadn't drawn these teeth, it would have looked really scary, like a person with only two uh, incisors there. But the idea is this mirror is actually producing an image of this tooth. This is the object, let's say. Because you know when you look at it from above, your teeth are arranged like this, and the mirror is right here to produce an image of this particular tooth. Okay, and I've, I've drawn it with this curvature because I, I'm anticipating the result here. Before we use the equation and try to draw an accurate diagram, Here's the idea. If this is one of the upper teeth in your mouth, this vertical line represents the placement of the concave mirror, and I've drawn the three principal rays. Here's my focal point. So I drew the tooth well inside the focal point. Now, all the distances are exaggerated here so that I could draw the diagram, but in reality, your tooth might be very close to that mirror. Those of you who have been to the dentist recently, you have some sense that when they put that thing in your mouth, it's not very far from your tooth. The mirror is close to your tooth. Um, and the focal length is probably rather short as well. So here's a ray leaving the top of the tooth. It comes in parallel to the optical axis and passes right back through the focal point. Here's a ray that comes in and hits the so-called vertex that's uh, on the optical axis. And using the law of reflection, it comes out at the same angle. And I extended that one backwards. I also extended the first ray backwards. You know, the first ray bounces out through the focal point. It looks like it's coming from back here. So these two rays alone were sufficient to locate the image, but it's nice to draw a third. The third ray comes out of the tooth as if it had originated at the focal point, and it will bounce back parallel, extend that ray backwards. And again, my advice is if you're doing this with a ruler, you might as well fudge it a little bit to make sure that the rays pass through the same point. I mean, don't be ridiculous. If, it, if it's obvious that you did that, then that's not a very good diagram. But the point is um, clarity here. I'm just doing this for illustrative purposes. If you were drawing the diagram to actually get a, a measured quantity, then you wouldn't want to fudge it. Just draw things as parallel as you can, draw the angles as close to the values uh, that they should have as possible. Let's use the equation, because what they're actually asking is, what do they tell us here? In number 63. Here. The information that's given is uh, we want the magnification to be 1.5. In other words, the image of the tooth should be one and a half times bigger than the tooth itself. The reason for that is, is pretty obvious, right? It's teeth aren't very large. If a dentist wants to get a good view of your cavity or whatever's going on, 
it needs to be expanded a little bit. Don't forget that magnification is negative S prime over S. So we already know what the ratio of these two quantities is. They tell us that the mirror is 1.2 centimeters from a tooth. So if I go back here, the mirror is 1.2 centimeters from the tooth. Well, that is the object distance. They've given us the object distance. We'd like to find the image distance. Okay. Well, they're asking us what the focal length should be for this lens. And also, is it concave or convex? I haven't even looked at convex lenses yet. Excuse me, convex mirrors. We haven't looked at convex mirrors yet, but we've already shown that a concave mirror can produce an, uh, an image that's taller than the object and a bright. That's what they're talking about. So I already know that we need a concave mirror. We're gonna see that convex mirrors, I believe they always produce images that are shorter than the object. Just think of a Christmas ornament, those spherical Christmas ornaments. When you look into those, everything you see is reduced in size. Okay, what's the focal length? Well, if we knew both object and image distances, we could easily, easily find the focal length using the mirror equation, but we're only given the object distance. We're told that um, the object distance is, what was it, one and a half? 1.2 centimeters, so S is equal to 1.2, excuse me. But since we know the magnification and we know the object distance, can't we solve for the image distance? So I'll say S prime, is negative ms, which is negative um, a magnification of 1.5 times an image distance of, and here's where you have to be, no, an object distance, the object distance was given, 1.2. So what's the significance of the minus sign? I really need to be better about this, keeping this in frame. 1.5 times 1.2. I get negative 1.8. What does that tell us? Well, the, the image is going to be 1.8 centimeters behind or in front of the mirror? Behind, because for a concave mirror, virtual images show up on the other side of the mirror. That's the significance of the minus sign. That is different from the convention for Converging lenses, you've probably had more experience with converging lenses at this point in your practice. A real object, excuse me, a real image distance corresponds to an image on the other side of the converging lens. This is different. For a concave mirror, if your image is on the other side, that's actually considered to be a virtual image. And so the image distance would be negative. It's hard to keep it all straight. Have those sign conventions available when you're doing problems. Okay. Now we can find the focal length. Over here, I'll say one over F would be, I don't even need to rewrite the equation. Let me just use the reciprocal button. Okay, one over S, I'm gonna hit 1.2 for the object distance, 1.2 reciprocal plus, and here's where you have to be careful. Don't forget that this image distance is a negative number. If you leave out the minus sign, this isn't gonna come out right. So I'll put 1.8, that was my calculated image distance, but it's up to me to insert the minus sign, then I take the reciprocal. Okay, when I hit equals, I now have the sum of the reciprocals. Well, that's equal to one over F, so I use the reciprocal button one more time to find F. I find that it should be 3.6 centimeters. Now, as a check, does this work out? Remember, if you're going, if you're gonna use a concave mirror to enlarge something, you need your object to be inside the focal point. Well, we just found that the focal length is over three centimeters and the tooth is only 1.2 centimeters from the mirror. So that works out. This tooth is inside the focal point of your little tiny concave mirror. Can we confirm all of this with a ray diagram? Let's do it, man. Here's a vertical line that represents the mirror. If I stick with the actual distances, my diagram will be really small. So I could start by just scaling everything up by two. Let's see if that makes the diagram big enough to interpret. 
Um, we're told that the object is 1.2 centimeters from the mirror. If I actually draw an object that's only 1.2 centimeters, see how cramped in it's all gonna be? So let me double that, which would be 2.4. I will draw. Papers are falling here. I will draw an object that's 2.4 centimeters from the mirror. And the problem is 1.2 centimeters, but I'm gonna double everything just for the purposes of drawing this diagram. And let me go with um, a reasonable height here of three. Notice they didn't actually tell me what the height of the tooth is. They just told me the magnification. So let me go with three centimeters here. Here is my object. This is the object distance. And we are told that we get an image, a magnification of 1.5. Okay, so how, how do we do this with the diagram, 1.5? I think what I'll have to do is use this relation, S prime is equal to negative M S. Yeah, they, they gave us the object distance and they also gave us the magnification. So I need to know where the image is and I can use this equation. I think I still need this relation. I can't do everything with just the ray diagram, can I? Okay, so that's gonna be uh, negative 1.5 times, well, I went with, um, let's not be confused here. 1.2 is the object distance just not on the diagram. So after I get this number, I'll double it and draw that over here. Okay, so the image needs to be 1.5. I already did this, 1.8, yeah. 1.8 centimeters behind. Well, on my diagram, everything's scaled up by a factor of two. So I'm going to draw the image 3.6 centimeters behind the mirror, which is right about here. And I'm gonna scale it up by a factor of one and a half. This number, I don't need to double for the diagram. I drew this three centimeters tall. Yeah. Three times one and a half, what is that, 7.5? Three times one and a half. 7.5, you fool, it's 4.5. <clears throat> okay. My image would look like this. Because your problem stated or was it the solutions manual that said, everything you've got out of the mirror equation can be confirmed with the ray diagram. So I wanna to try to do that. Here's my image distance. Technically this should be the absolute value of S prime, right? Because S prime is a negative number. I guess what I'm doing here is working backwards now. I need to draw a ray diagram without the focal point. I'm trying to find out what the focal point is. Hmm, well, Don't we have a ray that would, we have a ray that would uh, appear to be coming from back here, but it really was reflected off in this direction. Yes, okay, that's one of the rays. It would have to come from the tip of the arrow or the tooth in this case. Okay, so one of our principal rays leaves the tooth hits the mirror and comes out parallel. But this is the ray that goes off as if it came from the focal point. So I think the focal point would have to be back here. And you know what? We may have already determined the location of the focal point, but I'm gonna check that because I also know, well, this ray is not gonna tell me where the focal point is, is it? If I draw another ray that reflects at equal angles, this ray will look like it came from back here. That ray doesn't actually help me locate the focal point. The last one would be, aha, if a ray were to leave the top of the tooth, come in parallel to the optical axis, it would have to bounce off and look like it were coming from the image point, which means it has to go off in this direction. 
All right, and I guess I was careful enough with this diagram that everything worked out. So this diagram was worked backwards, knowing where the image is and how high it needs to be allowed me to locate the focal point. So let me measure that with my ruler. I find that this distance is seven. All right. Remember, I scaled everything up by two, so I would have to divide by two. Seven divided by two suggests that the focal length is three and a half centimeters. Isn't that the same number we found when we used the thin lens equation? Oh, close enough. I found 3.6. I'm surprised they even agree that well. So it's a powerful combination, ray tracing and the mirror equation or the thin lens equation, depending on which problem you're doing. 